pleased to see such a big crowd here today. Uh, I, I've been doing a lot of speaking on Palestine, and I, and the, I am not uh, of Palestinian origin, but I first went to Palestine in 1985 as a student. I went to learn about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. There was something called the Great Lakes Jerusalem Program that, that took students from the Great Lakes region and put them in the old city before there were walls that kept Palestinians out of Jerusalem. Um, but Jerusalem for Palestinians at the, from the West Bank at the time was effectively a sundown town. Still and yet, we were in a hotel in the, in the old city of Jerusalem. We had three Palestinian professors from, from uh, Birzeit University and three Israeli professors. I think two of them were from Tel Aviv, one from Hebrew University. And it allowed us to be exposed to what was happening. This was in 1985. Um, and invariably, students came away from that, from that experience uh, um, ready to advocate for justice for Palestinians. The other thing I'll note is that the year before I went, they had tried to have a reception for all the professors and the students at the end of the semester. And the Israelis put a, top, a stop to it because when people started talking about the condition, it became too uncomfortable for the Israeli professors. This is 1985, right? I have since gone back repeatedly so, and I've lived, I lived in Jerusalem and then uh, Ramallah from 1993 to 1998. I've gone on delegations between 1985 and, and 1993 and have uh, did my uh, graduate, first graduate thesis looking at historical perspectives of landscape change in the West Bank, in the Southern West Bank in particular. Um, then, and, and that's, in the story since I've gone back until the pandemic, I had gone back every year, at least once. I have dear, dear, dear friends in Palestine. What I'm gonna do today is actually um, a bit of a shift in gears um, because what I want to make sure is there's, that people understand is that there's, there's an ecological component to this. So um, I'm going to read some things, and then I've got some notes that I'm going to speak from after that. So it is springtime. Palestinian, Palestine sits at the same hemisphere as the United States. So I'm getting updates now from my Palestinian colleagues and dear friends who are, who are farmers. Pelahin, which literally means peasant farmers, who in, in the West Bank, as they are going out and preparing their polycultural terraces, for planting a new season. Many, I should note, are doing this despite attacks on their land by the Israeli occupation forces and settlers last year. But the principle of samud, steadfastness, resilience, means that as a Palestinian, you go back and you plant again, even if settlers came at harvest time last year and burned your, and burned your land. The, the reality though, is that this is not happening in Gaza, right? The planting of land. And what I have found in going around and speaking is most people in the United States would, would presume that this never happened in Gaza. Yet, years ago, when we would, we would visit our friends in Gaza, and we have very dear friends in Gaza, through the early 2000s, we have fond memories of sitting in, orchard, in orange orchards, having breakfast as the aroma of blossoms wafted through the air. Even in 2016, when living in Ramallah, this season was the time of Raula, strawberries. And at that time, strawberries would come into the market and you would rush to get them there. Because, because they were limited in supply and everyone wanted Gazan strawberries. While the restrictions on, plant, on planting limited and limited water for irrigation and restrictions on, on uh, export limited how much could get out, the ecological conditions of sandy soil and the Southern geographic location made Gaza the ideal location for growing this fruit. 
Gaza sits at the edge of the Negev Desert, but it is also a strip of land that abuts the Mediterranean Sea. Gazans would also speak with pride about the fish that one could get in Gaza. While Gaza is a place of relatively low rainfall, there, there were three major bodies. These are effectively um, uh, valleys through which, the, um, through which water would come from the southern Hebron hills. And that water could be, could, would provide moisture as it flowed through to the sea, providing opportunities for planting. So it would also infiltrate in, making, uh, allowing Gaza to have, uh, have groundwater that was fertile. Since 1948, that, that ecological system has been severely disrupted. And it, it's been disrupt, it disrupted through, um, through geography, but also through demographics. In 1948, 220,000 Palestinians from, from over 190 villages were, were relocated to Gaza as part of the, as part of the Nakba leading to an overpopulation. Likewise, between 1948 and 1955, the Israeli government established, established water catchments that limited water to all but one of those wadis. Indeed, it actually limited water to, the, to Wadi Gaza as well, which, uh, which had led to the, the wadi already suffering severely severe ecological conditions. In addition, Israel, Israel once it mined the coastal aquifer to the point of um, severe contamination within Israel, put wells on the edge of Gaza, undermining the uh, undermining the groundwater. Um, the groundwater capacity. So by the time I was I was a professional in Gaza, which is to say I was going there working with NGO environmental NGOs, one of the indicators of how poor the water quality was in Gazan wells was that every person I interacted with had grappled with kidney stones because the water was so salty. This is the context through which we, we should think about the current conditions where we're hearing about water deprivation. Indeed, before October 7th, it was estimated by the United Nations that 97% of the endogenous water sources in Gaza were unfit for human, human consumption, 97%. So Gaza had been made wholly dependent on, um, on water imported from Israel or water that had been treated in, um, desal in packaged desal plants. Within the first month of the current war, all of those local treatment plants and 80% of the pipelines had been destroyed in what, in what Pax International referred to as an intentional campaign of destroying, of destroying water, the water capacity within Gaza. It is also the case that in the sub, first in the enclosure of, of Gaza, and then in the subsequent bombings, and remember, Gaza has been subjected to bombings repeatedly since, since 2007. And lest we think this was just about the Hamas takeover, one of the memories that sears in my mind was going to visit our dear friend in Han Yunus in 2004. And she took a, and this was just after an Israeli attack on, on, um, on Southern uh, Gaza. And she took us around and you could see full neighborhoods that were bombed out. And I started to walk down the street. She said, don't. There are Israeli snipers on the roof up there. They will shoot you for walking in the street. 
This was happening before Hamas came into power. The closure of Gaza was a systematic process that happened starting in 1948 and then was simply ramped up over time. And that closure served not only to keep people in, but to, but to limit the capacity of Gazans to produce their own food and to, and to make Gazans wholly dependent on imports of food. So when we hear about famine, we hear about, we have to be cognizant of a, of a process of what we might call ecocide. And it is this that, that Professor Neve Gordon and Muna Haddad are talking about in a recent publication where they talk about the progressive implementation of restrictions on agricultural production and the destruction of agricultural land. So farmers in Gaza in the last decade have been talking about how their land, those orange, orange groves that I used to go and have breakfast in, had been, had been taken out to, pro to provide Israel's buffer zone. Right? Um, uh, we, the, um, and, and so it is not a surprise that, that Gazans then, oh, and the, that fish that Gazan, those, those fishing resources that Gazans were most proud of, as somebody who follows what has been happening, one of the things I noted prior to, to, prior to October 7th were almost weekly reports of Gazan fishers being fired on by the Israeli occupation forces because they were, they were trying, to find, trying to move into their fishing waters, internationally recognized fishing waters. But Israel was explicitly restricting how far out they could go. So there's been this effort to destroy the, the, the ecological capacity of Gaza. And then through that, to, res to restrict the ability of Gazans to farm on their own and provide their own food. And now to restrict how much food can come in, leading to the, to, to the horrible conditions of famine that we see since, since October 7th. To add to this problem of ecocide, we can then think of the intellectual capacity. Among the things that I was doing with, with colleagues in Gaza, even though I couldn't get in, was thinking about how do we improve the, the, the capacity to, to sustainably produce within this environment. And as a professor, I was collaborating with other professors. None of those institutions where they worked stand anymore. They have all been bombed. Every university in Gaza has been bombed to the point of, of not being able to be used. More than 100 professors at those universities have been killed. And in the case of colleagues, of my own colleagues, I don't know that they have died, but what I can tell you is they, they were communicating with me through December and had talked about loss of dozens of family members, and then they stopped communicating. There is every reason to believe that they are simply buried under the rubble and not counted. So, so we, we have a situation in Gaza where we're talking about ecocide and talking about scholasticide, destroying the capacity of Gaza to recover should the, should the bombing ever stop. So what I'll leave with is this. There must be another way. Sadly, for those of us who are here in the United States, we must recognize that the destruction of Gaza, the destruction of Palestinian, uh, agri uh, Palestinian productive capacity, the destruction of lives has a resonance historically. It echoes the settler colonial genocide that happened right here. Indeed, there was a very powerful article 
published in the, in the Minneapolis Star Tribune that compared the genocidal attack by the American army on the Dakota, on the Dakota peoples following a, a, following a relatively minor attack by the Dakotas on settlers who had taken their land and deprived, their, and deprived them of their well-being. But we do, as Lexi very much told us, we have the power to stop this. What is happening in Gaza can be the metaphor for the dystopic future that has been set up for us. A world of, of demonic AI-generated bombs that kills not only people, but the entire families. A world where we take ecological systems and systematically destroy them. For in the interest of power of one people over another. That is the dystopic future. And yet there are, are alternatives. We could put our money to better things. We could be spending our tax dollars on making a better, a better ecosystem, on making a place like Palestine sustainable so that all people could flourish. But we have to, we have to exercise that political will and we have to organize to do that. So I'll close with that.